Alexa is going to be uh, uh, starting off. Um, Tini's a, the CEO, principal of Alexa Real Estate, pretty much heads up all the property management uh, division. Now, uh, Tanya uh, got her first property when she was 19, so she's been in some uh, shape or form managing uh, properties for probably just a bit over 30 years. Uh, 20 years of that has been probably professional property management. Um, mm -hmm. In that time, given that you're dealing with people, you're also going to be dealing with a lot of interesting experiences, but she's got a fair, uh, a fair bit of uh, knowledge with regards to how to handle certain, uh, certain things in property management. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of different things that can come up. Uh, so she's got a wealth of knowledge, uh, and what we're going to be speaking about today is basically insurance as an asset protection. Uh, so we're going to uh, get us started with uh, her introduction, and then she'll lead the way into the other speakers we've got today. Thanks for coming as well. Um, and if you could also just uh, maybe keep your phones on silent, and uh, during the presentation, if you keep any questions towards the end, we'll maybe have a panel of questions and answers at the end, and uh, give everyone an opportunity to ask whatever questions they have. Thanks, guys. Well, welcome everyone. Um, good to have everyone here. And yeah, if you can just keep all questions uh, towards the end, that'd be great because we're filming and it's really difficult for um, YouTube videos when there's a lot of interruptions. Um, so today we're going to be talking about minimising the risk in investment properties and especially using uh, landlord insurance and debt collection agencies like, um, like Barclay. Uh, but what I, what I want to do is present to you the, the, the property manager side of things because one of the things that people say is why do we really need landlord insurance and why do we need all these extra stuff when we've got a really good property manager because nothing ever goes wrong right, in, in investment properties. So first off the bat, when you buy an investment property, you, are in, you have to have some kind of insurance. So they, once you sign, sign that deed, the, the loan, the, the bank obligates you to have insurance on that property, right? So there's three types of insurance that you can have on an investment property. You have landlord's insurance, you have public liability insurance, and you have building insurance. Now, when you are, when you are signing the papers for the bank, they will not allow you to leave without, without uh, building insurance because what they're doing is they are actually uh, insuring their asset. So they've just given you a loan against that property, so they are insuring their own asset. They don't care if you lose money in, in rent later on. Where it gets confusing though, is what they sometimes call landlord's insurance is actually a building insurance policy for a landlord, but it doesn't actually insure you for the lease. It is, it is a it is just building insurance for, for the landlord and it becomes really confusing. Um, we're dealing with a situation now in our, in our office where a landlord actually thought he had building insurance and he does not. He has, oh, sorry, he thought he had landlord's insurance but they only do building cover. They don't actually insure you for, for the lease. Um, that what, what landlord insurance does, it ensures this valuable piece of paper called the lease agreement. Um, so if an average property in Adelaide at the moment is fetching say $500 a week, that's $26,000 a year, a, a landlord insurance policy will actually insure your income of $26,000 a year as per that contract. That contract is very valuable. Whereas a building insurance does not do that. They, they do, you know, if your house burns down or floods or um, there's a burst pipe in the wall or something like that, they'll insure those things, but they don't really care about the income of your property. So this is about, about the income of your property. This is, this is what this, this segment here is about. When we do a landlord claim in our, in our office, uh, when we do a, an insurance claim, Probably about 90% of the time, or 95% of the time, it is for rent arrears. So the uh, the tenant has fallen into arrears for that property. Uh, those those things that you see on the news where somebody goes around with a sledgehammer and smashes everything, that, that rarely happens in investment properties. Uh, what, what is likely to happen is that the tenant will get into default, uh, so and that they're not able to uh, pay their rent for a range of reasons which we're going to go in 
uh, right now. So one of the reasons that tenants fall into, into arrears is because it, people usually don't know how to manage their, their money no, correctly. So who here has had an absolute 100% perfect record in, in managing their finances? So you've got enough money in that month to manage all of your finances, you've paid all your bills on time, and you've managed enough income to come in to cover everything. Always. Anyone? You've had a perfect record? Well, congratulations to you. <laughs> uh, most of us have what we call roller coaster financials. So, you know, money's coming in, it doesn't cover enough, it goes into the next bills, um, especially if you're managing a business and, and all of that kind of thing. So most of most most people have that kind of those kinds of financials. Not everybody, uh, but a lot of people have that so that is that that is one of the reasons uh, we minimize that risk by screening tenants now there's, there's a lot to a, a screening process in um, in rentals one of the one of the, excuse the green on here by the way so I'm looking at it it's a different color to what's on my screen um, one of the screening criteria that we use is we we try to ensure that the the rent is lower than what well, the rental amount is lower than 30 percent of the income or the combined income of the tenants that are going into that property so if uh if if a house is say um, 500 dollars a week we want to see an income of around 1650 1700 a week uh, to cover that so that's making the assumption that um <clears throat> that they can actually live off the other 70%. Now, some people can, some people can't. So it's not taking into, into consideration the frugality of a, um, a, a tenant. So somebody might be able to live on 70%, somebody may not. But we have to have some kind of cutoff, cut off, right? Um, and that cutoff is, is um, 70%. If you look at somebody like my grandmother, she used to be able to live on 10% of her pension. You know, I, I, I didn't inherit that kind of frugality from her. Uh, you know, but people, people differ in uh, their ability to be able to, uh, what they can actually live off. So what we look at next is their rent record. So we look at their ability to pay. So, so we've got this, this cut off of 30%. We don't know how frugal they are, we don't know if they've got a gambling habit, we don't really know anything about these tenants, so we need to look at, at rental history. So we, we look at their, their previous rental history, if they don't have any rental history, we look at their, their mortgage payments. We look at some kind of records that tell us that this tenant has an ability to pay on time. And then we extrapolate, right? We, we add these abstractions where we say past behaviour, has to equal future behaviour, and now you know this is the this is the risk that we're we're doing on a tenant. Past behaviour though doesn't always equal future behaviour. You know there there have been tenants that have been in in arrears in the past due to divorces and all sorts of things that actually perform really well in future. Uh, but again, you know we're, we're drawing these arbitrary things, not factoring in um, you know personal criteria because we don't really know that, that that person very well and then we take a risk and we get it right about 95% of the time and this is really all we can do but each tenant that goes into a property is actually a risk you know some more risk than others but they are they are actually a risk to the landlord all the time so let's look at some of the things that can actually go wrong in a rental property uh, and things that we can't actually screen for. So we can't screen for tenants getting sick. Uh, we had a situation in our office where we had this, this lovely tenant uh, who's been in, in a property for about four or five years. Uh, she was in her 50s, uh, she was working, good job, and all of a sudden she has a stroke, just out of the blue, had a stroke. This lady did not know how to navigate the, um, the welfare system. 
Uh, she didn't know how to ask the right questions, so she went into Centrelink. I think they gave her a bag of vegetables or something and sent her out um, because she, she didn't know how to, how to navigate that whole thing. Um, it took her a long time to actually get on top of things. In the meantime, she got evicted from, from the property. So now we're left with, with an arrears situation in that property, in a, in a tenant that has been you know, previously good. Uh, divorce. So you don't know who's going to stay married and, and who's not going to stay married. And you, you have no idea when you're putting a couple into a property, you can't ask the question of how stable is your marriage? You know, are you actually thinking of uh, walking out on your husband or leaving your wife tomorrow? You know, you can't ask those questions. And if you do, they're, they're going to be denied anyway. And, and that you've got, we've got nothing to be able to screen um, for those for the for that situation. Um, when we're looking at that thirty percent factor, if if we get a lot of prop, um, a lot of applications like we have been during this this COVID boom period where we would get 30, 40 applications on a property, if we can find a tenant with a single income that meets that 30% criteria, that would be our preferred tenant because there's no risk of divorce there. Uh, but that is not always possible. Sometimes we have to consider two incomes, which means that if there is a marriage separation or a relationship breakup, and the one that is left behind usually can't afford the rent and it's only a matter of time before they start defaulting in rent. Um, loss of job or a transfer of job into state, that is a big one uh, where we get phone calls from tenants saying, uh, I've left the property, keys are in the property, I'm in Melbourne, um, that's the end of my lease. Just out of, out of nothing. Um, all of a sudden they've, they've just um, accepted a job in Melbourne and they're gone. Um, and it's usually like four to five weeks um, by the time we get in there, clean it up, put it on the market, find another tenant, there's, there's like four to five weeks uh, loss of rent. Usually that loss of rent, uh, if, if the tenant is not paying, which they usually don't uh, during a break list situation, it is claimed on landlord's insurance. And this is where you need a really good insurance policy because a lot of the bank ones uh, will actually use the bond as an excess. And if you're using the bond as an excess on the property, you might as well not do a claim at all. It's, it's not worth doing a claim. What you want is the luxury to be able to have that bond and use it for non-insurable expenses. So things like water, water um, usage and supply charge that the, the tenant has not um, paid, uh, cleaning invoices, um, gardening in, invoices, things that are not claimable, you want to be able to use the, uh, the bond for something like that, and um, have your insurance be excess free um, to do that claim on, on rent arrears. Um, okay. One of the things that we see where, where properties do get damaged is in domestic violence situations and for whatever reason, uh, people in Adelaide at the moment are going psychotic. Uh, you know, there is a lot of domestic violence in, in rental properties and that's probably the number one reason uh, for, for damage to properties. And again, we can't screen for this. You know, you can't actually say to a tenant, so how many psychos have you dated in your life? You know, <laughs> you know that, <laughs> that, that's that's not something that you can ask, and it's not something that yeah. that that you can actually screen for or even find out. Uh, and we see situations where you know somebody came from Queensland to escape some abusive ex-husband or jealous ex-boyfriend or something like that, and all of a sudden he's taking the tiles off the roof to break in through the ceiling. Um, and then she's gone and once she's gone we have no idea where she's gone because you know once once a psycho has caught up with them they disappear um, so again this is a, this is where you need landlord's insurance to cover cover that damage on the property that cannot be screened for All right, some of these, these are just a little bit of, of our claims that we have done um, and just a, a few a few little horror stories. So we had, um, that's actually a toilet on fire, 
like in that picture. So we had we had a situation a, a, a few years ago. Um, again, tenant in the property, she, she had been there for about four or five years, and she rang us up one day on an emergency number saying um, the house is on fire. The story that she gave us was she got up in the middle of the night and she thought one of the kids had left the heater on um, because the house was hot. And as she was walking through the corridor, she saw like light coming out of the bathroom. She went into the bathroom, the whole toilet was on fire. Um, what happened was the, uh, the exhaust fan on top um, had an electrical fault, it caught on fire. The whole thing fell onto the toilet seat, the whole toilet caught on fire. Um, not only that, but the, you know, the toilet roll caught on fire and then the door and then um, the fire brigade was, was cold. They did more damage than, than the actual fire. They sprayed water everywhere, there was water damage, there was fire damage, there was smoke, there was, you know, there, there was probably about 10 to 20,000 worth of damage in that property. So the tenant got scared, we fixed the, the electrical issue. Um, supplied a, a certificate of compli electrical compliance. She said, no, 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 no. I no longer trust exhaust fans. I could have died. She's gone. Um, not only is she gone, but she had been in that property for, for about five years. So her little kids grew up in that property. So everything that was no longer needed, like prams and high chairs and cots and things like that, that the kids outgrew, got left behind in that property. So, you know, and then it starts the, the cleaning team, you know, why clean things up when you can actually leave it all to a property manager to, to look after and project manage, right? Um, you know, skip bins, getting rid of all of, all of the, the, the rubbish, um, cleaning it up, repainting, all of that. Again, it was, it was an insurance claim and I think the, the, uh, the landlord was out of pocket very little um, because they had good landlord's insurance on that property. Um, in the, in the last 20 years that we've been managing properties, we have seen one single meth lab um, in, in a property. And it, was in a, it was actually a funny situation because the, um, the landlord lived next door. Not only that, but the landlord was actually friends with the tenant. Uh, so when we got a, um, a, a call from, we actually got a a letter from the council saying you need to evict these tenants on the grounds of what? So we inspected the property, couldn't see anything. Uh, couldn't see anything, there was no detectable um, evidence of um, methamphetamines or anything like that. So we didn't know what, what, we had no idea what we were doing. We were just told to evict these tenants. So we put in a, a, a claim to actually evict the tenants. Got to SACAP. Saker so looked at the letter, looked at the tenant, said, you've got seven days to vacate. Is it based on what? Well, based on this letter. Well, where's the evidence? Well, there is no evidence. Um, apparently, that's, that's how they work. <laughs> um, so what happened was, I think the, somebody tipped off the police. They went in, uh, they broke the door down, went in, pointed guns at the tenants, uh, and found some kind of thing um, in the... the light fittings because <laughs> um, uh, real estate agents don't inspect don't, don't unscrew light fittings and inspect what's behind light fittings uh, just in case there's you know residues of methamphetamine or whatever uh, we got the, the property tested um, and it was positive mm -hmm. so then we went down the, the path got a quote to clean it fifteen thousand dollars to clean to clean it there were walls that were not cleaned, so we had to go in, scrape the gym rock off those walls. Um, then we got it tested again. The walls were okay. There was there was a window frame that was not okay. We had to take the whole window frame off, reframe the window, throw everything in the bin uh, for a new window frame, uh, and then we got it tested again. Um, this time everything was okay except the shaving cabinet in the bathroom. So the, uh, the carpenters went back, took the shaving cabinet off and then it was, it was okay. Now I'm talking about this, this took almost 12 months. So landlord's insurance stepped in, not only did they pay for the 49,000 or whatever it was of damage to the property by the time you scrape walls and 
cleaning and all of that, um, <clears throat> but they also paid um, the, the, the 52 weeks of rent that the, um, the property was in arrears for. So this is a, this is a kind of reason why you actually need um, landlord's insurance. So you don't you you don't know what is going to happen. So even when a tenant is screened properly, uh, like I said, we we use abstractions to clean to um to, to screen them. We use um, we use criteria based on the part on the past. We use an arbitrary number of thirty percent without really knowing uh, whether they can live on 70%. Uh, we think that because they have done it in the past, they can, they're going to do it in the future. We can't account for you know, jealous ex-boyfriends, uh, we can't account for um, divorces and sickness and uh, people taking jobs interstate and all of that kind of thing. So, so things can creep in. Um, I would say about, about 5% of tenants are likely to fall into default at, any, at, at some given time. More in some areas than others, uh, but this is the reason why you need that protection and, and landlord's insurance. So with that said, does anyone have any questions while I'm setting up the next speaker? Is that 30% of income that is it grass or net income? Sorry, what was that? You said 30% of their salary, the rent should be. Is it gross or net? It would be, it would be uh, gross. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> gross income. Oh, Do we have any other questions? Talk to me guys. I'll introduce myself before it comes up, so it's fine. Um, my name's Amy, I'm from EBM uh, Landlord Insurance. Um, I'm an Executive Relationship Manager here in South Australia. Um, so thank you to Alexa Real Estate for having me here tonight. I'm just going to go through um, just a little bit in depth about the importance of landlord insurance, um, things to look out for when you are considering insurance, um, and just a few different claims examples for you as well. So a um, few different things to go through, but hopefully all good. Um, I, I've got it here, it's just not, not open. No, you are trying to rename the file, mm -hmm. not opening. Yes. What am I trying to do? You are trying to rename the file name. Just click on something else and then reopen. Yep. Yep. You are clicking on the side. Click on some other file and then double click. Some other file now, click double click. Mm -hmm.
Have you got a USB port on it? We should have. I'll never use it before. Sorry, no worries. Can mm -hmm. you have to use it? No, that's that's my presentation. Mm -hmm. That's one that I just had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might be downloaded. Yeah, I know. It's so odd. I think Wi-Fi is not there. I don't know. I'm trying to connect Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. I should use your internet card. Sorry, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah, yeah this one is all good. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to... Well, change plan. Uh -huh. Change yeah. plan. Yeah. I think that's a problem. Yeah. So, while, we, while I'm trying to work this out, I'd like to introduce David Banks. Uh, David is from uh, Barclay MIS, uh, who is a debt collection company. And... Um, I'm sure he was going to tell you a lot more about it. So I met David probably about when we started a long time more ago. More years ago than I can remember. And I recognised him by his moustache. He's got the same moustache from... It looks like it looks a personality. It looks fantastic. Damn. So take it away, David, or yours. Well, I'm the, I'm the human USB or PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so our company, Barclay MIS, we're at, we are a debt collection company. We've been dealing in residential and commercial tenancies now for some 40 years. We act for around 5,000 real estates Australia-wide in residential and commercial tenancies in one division. Um, and it was listening, interesting to hear about the comments about what causes a bad tenant. And we have a saying that says, every bad tenant was once a good tenant. And we know statistically, there are six prime causes of tenancy problem in Australia. Loss of income, Breakdown of relationship, illness, alcohol, gambling, drugs. The last three affect the first three as a general rule. And you'll find as a general rule in all tenancy claims that come through, one of those six will be in the mix and all out of the control of your property manager or your agent. But having said that, there are things we can do. Now, those of you who have our, our subscription in place, you will pay $66 per annum in the event of the tenant not paying his rent and or damaging your property. You or maybe a claim will go through your insurer. We will then come in and pick up the shortfall or any shortfall that's based on that insurance claim for whatever reason. Uh, your property manager will obtain the SACAD order. That order comes to us and we then go and pursue that tenant and cover those monies on your behalf. In that process, you pay no legal fees, no commissions, no percentages. Your only outlay is your $66 per annum, tax deductible. And do you want to go back to EDM? No. Okay? Okay. All right. So that's our role. But one of the things we do is, is that we look to get involved with your property manager early on. So day four of arrears, they've got access to start generating arrears, SMSs, emails coming from the debt collector to the tenant. So the goal is to either solve the problem or reduce the quantum of the claim. Okay, so we're looking to work front end where possible to stop that from occurring. Worst case scenario, if you have to, as an example, you have to evict your tenant, your property manager will go to SACAT, they will get an order, and interestingly, you've got to pay for it down here. Mind you, you're lucky. In Western Australia, they are the dearest in Australia. The, an eviction in Western Australia will start at $700 oh for the bailiff to attend on the day. In Queensland, it's free because it's done by the police. It's ex executed by the police. So your property manager will obtain that warrant of possession. What they can then do is, if you have that in place, they can contact us and we will liaise with the authorities. One of our people will attend on the day if the tenant's sitting in the house with a house full of furniture, we'll make a phone call, we'll have our trucks turn up, we pack them up, move them out, store them, all at no cost to you. 
all covered under that there. But what will happen is, as your property manager is going through and applying for that warrant of possession, we will be in touch with the tenant. Mr. Tenant, if you don't get the rent arrears fixed up, this is what's going to happen. There will be a warrant issue. We'll be coming back with the authorities. You will be evicted. It's not negotiable. Or, if you don't feel you can pay the arrears, pack up and move now. Save yourself the expense and the heartache. So we're working at the front end to solve a lot of these problems that occurred. Okay? Now, in relation to we, uh, the ap application process, the property manager has access free of charge to our defaulting tenants database. It's a national database, which we have, of defaulting people. And they're out there, bless their hearts, should be more of them. Salt of the earth. Because the more default we have, the more we need it. But we're working with your property manager to solve the problem preferably. Any questions at this, uh, at this point? No? Go ahead. Uh, did I hear that you have to have landlord insurance before your insurance? Nope. No, you don't need that. No, totally separate products. Both stand alone in their own right. And we have, and we have clients who just have our cover. Um, if anybody asks us, we say to them, realistically, it's a commercial decision you've got to make based on your situation. Personally, with my rental properties, I have landlord insurance. Because we have our own company. Because they cover a different range of things. At $66, it's pretty cost efficient to have it in place with your insurance. My place often referred to as insurance, and landlords do say, why should I have two insurances? But could you explain the difference, please, between a landlord insurance and bar place, which is not insurance, but a debt collection agency Correct. after the fact? So the difference will be, okay, insurance generally works on the basis that there is a trigger, which is an insurable act, and Amy will give you all the, all the guff on that, an insurable act occurs, e.g. don't pay the rent, punch a hole in the wall, uh, whatever, whatever. That's the insurable act. So you, you're insuring against a defined insurable act. Where we're concerned, we have none of that. We don't differentiate between dam malicious damage or accidental damage. To us, damage is damage. It's rent arrears, it's a hole in the wall, it's the, the water's not paid for. Whatever forms the say cat order is what we pursue. And the reason we say to the property manager to proceed and get a say cat order is because once you have that order, you have a legally enforceable debt. Until you have the say cat order, all you have is an overdue account. With a say cat order, we can Call them into court for examinations, garnish your wages, seize assets, take the baby's high chair, refer him without the baby. Uh, but all those things can be done to recover your money. And that's our role is to recover the money. Does that cover that answer your It's clear? Okay. Anything else at all before we hand over to the to our insurer? That was easy. Done. Thank you for your time. Here comes Try the A team. Try again. again. <laughs> oh, I'd like to introduce Amy from EBM Insurance. <laughs> this is the movie side, Cool. All right. Um, I did introduce myself before. Um, basically, my role at EBM is just to uh, provide training and education to our real estate partners. Obviously, Alexa Real Estate. Um, is one of those, which means I'm also a direct contact for any uh, questions, concerns, uh, which gives you guys the peace of mind if you do decide to take out a policy. If something does happen at your property, they can just pick up the phone and speak with me, um, especially when there's things like claims um, that happen at the property. So I'm just going to talk about, uh, as I said before, just some general um, insurance uh, scenarios, uh, what we cover, and um, there will be time for questions as well if you do have any Uh, just so you know, EBM has been around since 1991 and we were one of the first landlord insurance policies in Australia. 
We have over 165,000 policies that we um, have covering properties in Australia and there's roughly 100 employees all working in Australia. Our head office is in Victoria. We have one in Western Australia. Uh, relationship uh, managers like myself are across Australia as well. So they're taking care of real estate um, agents in different uh, states. So um, we already went through uh, basically what the risks that are faced by residential landlords today. Um, you have your tenant related risks um, known as landlord insurance, which is your loss of rent, your tenant damage, etc. You've got your building insurance to cover non-tenant risks, so the structural damage from fire, storm, flood events, things like that. And then you've got a combined landlord and building insurance policy if you want to have the full coverage for your property. So uh, strata units, there is often a little bit of confusion around who covers what or what you need insurance for when it comes to a strata unit. So just to put it simply, generally speaking, anything from the paint inwards is landlord's responsibility. So things like contents, which is carpets, curtains, blinds, and floating floors, um, also painting on the wall sometimes, um, your tenant related risks, as I said before, loss of rent, tenant damage, and also legal liability. So inside the unit, if the tenant or their guests injure themselves inside the property, legal liability is to cover you if they do take you to court and you're found liable. Body corporate is uh, responsible for the building structure. So generally speaking, uh, your cabinets, your walls, etc., and then your common areas. So the things like your legal liability and for damages to paths and garages and things like that. If you do um, have a strata unit, generally you'll just take out a landlord insurance policy. Um, obviously, not covering a building insurance, but you'd want the contents. In one way but not the other way okay cool um yes all right so what's generally covered under a good landlord insurance policy now there are uh, definitely some specialized landlord insurance policies on the market that you can obviously have a look at but the big things to look at are definitely tenant damage now there's three situations of tenant damage which you should be considering if you do want tenant cover under the policy accidental damage so this is if the tenant for example spills red wine on the carpet um, also damage caused by children is generally an accident. Uh, deliberate damage, uh, so that's for if the tenant painters a feed through a wall or something like that. Um, and then malicious damage, which is pretty straightforward, like punching holes in the wall. Um, some insurers will cover all of them. We cover all of them. Some will cover one, some will cover none. So always good to double check um, if that's important to you. If you do have a freestanding home, like you would uh, to your own home, um, definitely consider taking out building insurance um, just in general. Um, if you don't want landlord insurance, definitely consider building insurance. Um, costs associated with taking legal action against your tenant. So legal expenses that you incur um, on behalf of the property manager going to save that on your behalf. Um, so we cover up to $5,000 of legal expenses and that will include things like bailiff fees, etc. as we went through. Um, Loss of rent, there are a few scenarios which I'll go through in a sec, um, but that is definitely something that you should consider when you're looking at landlord insurance policies. Um, and yeah, there are different circumstances to excesses, but we don't have any excesses. Legal liability, as I mentioned before, if you're going to take out the cheapest policy on the market, I would suggest legal liability be part of that. So even if you don't think tenant damage is important, loss of rent, legal liability should definitely be the minimum of your policy. Uh, we cover 30 million. Uh, most insurers will cover anything between 10 and 30. The policies that we offer at EDM, it's quite simple. We've got our rent cover ultra, which as I said before, landlord and contents insurance, your tenant related risks are included in that. And then you've got your rent cover platinum, which is combined um, landlord contents and building insurance. Uh, so it's up to you, you can either take out landlord and contents policy and take out a building insurance elsewhere if you wish or you can take out a combined uh, policy to cover all those risks as well. Rent cover platinum is based on a building sum insured figure for your property. Now every year it is really good to actually just check your renewal and make sure that your sum insured is um, accurate for your property. As we know like interest rates everything's going up so trades, materials etc what it cost to rebuild your property last year, probably not the same this year. 
Um, so definitely something to consider, but that is how uh, we generally price those policies um, and how old the property um, is. Rank Cover Ultra is priced on which state the property is located in. You can definitely contact um, Alexa Real Estate if you do have questions about pricing. Probably won't touch too much on the importance of a bond because we did go through this before. Um, as you're aware, probably um, as of the 1st of April, bonds have been reduced from six weeks to four weeks uh, for rents under $800. And working with my property managers in South Australia, that rents are generally under $800 a week. So very important to have your bond. However, we realise in the insurance industry, it's not covering too much. Uh, we went through, you know, your cleaning bills. Uh, they can be in itself $1,200. So very important um, to consider landlord insurance where the bond will not be adequate to cover everything. Loss of rent, um, these are just some stats for you. Last year we paid over a thousand uh, claims for loss of rent and another uh, 1,199 claims were for loss of rent and accidental damage combined. So accidental damage, probably the main one uh, to get cover for. Obviously accidents happen, so very important to have that in the policy. Um, we cover under Ultra and Platinum denial of access. So this covers if the tenant remains in the property after the termination date, and it is up to 52 weeks of cover. So we'll cover from when the tenants stop paying rent up until they vacate, plus up to six weeks relet period as well. So you've got that peace of mind there. There is a loss of rent for rent default, which is the period prior to your termination date, prior to the Form 2 being issued, and it's up to six weeks of cover. So this is generally, they leave at the end of their lease agreement owing a couple of weeks rent. There's loss of rent for repair time. Um, so if there is insurable damage to the property, whether it be contents, tenant damage, building damage, depending on which policy you have, there'll be loss of rent for the repair period, so how long it takes to relet the property um, for those repairs. Also cover for death of a tenant as well, up to uh, 52 weeks. And as I said before, there's no excess for loss of rent claims. We did talk about this before, but I will um, touch on it just a tiny bit. Um, MEPAS, uh, but more importantly, just drug labs overall. Um, so obviously there is no uh, way to foresee, um, as we've said, uh, that a tenant is going to be using the property as a drug lab. Uh, they are generally quite smart about it these days, uh, but there are some things you can definitely look out for. Um, some things that we've um, discovered that are um, a value are things like if they have removed uh, smoke detectors and things like that in the property, certainly something to look out for. Obviously that's a fire risk anyway. Um, things like excessive security, so if they put barbed wire fencing, or if they put heaps of CCTV cameras, um, if there is smells of chemicals in the property, um, and one of the big ones is extractor fans or pool cleaning equipment in odd locations or where there's not actually a pool. Um, so there's some, there's some uh, ones for you. We do have a lot of this type of information on our info center on our website. So if you do wanna look into that sort of stuff a little bit more, feel free to do that. It's just general information for the public. Speaking about that though, this is just a claim. I won't go in depth because we already went through a meth lab claim, but just so you can get the general idea of a claim that we have actually paid as a business. Um, this was a methamphetamine lab, uh, hydroponic lab setup, so generally not as much damage. Um, as we've said before, there's testing at the property that gets done. This claim was about two years old, so testing's probably increased and it's different in every state as well. So in this instance, it was just over $2,000 just to do the testing in the property. There's remediation, so the attempt to remove contamination at the property, which was in this instance over $44,000, which is extreme. Um, and then you've got repairs and replacements. So if the chemicals cannot um, remove the contamination, you have to just rip everything out, um, where there's carpets, appliances, painting, shutters, bricks, remotes. Um, I've heard of door handles, air conditioners, everything's going to go. Uh, so in that um, claim it was $20,000. So just so you know, all of these damages here are covered up to $70,000 under Ultra. Um, and that's under drug lab cleanup. Then you've got the loss of rent due to the property being uninhabitable. So as I said before, 52 weeks loss of rent. 
uh, which was over $12,400. So huge, it takes ages to get all this done. Um, very important to consider not only drug lab cleanup, but loss of rent for repair time for these scenarios. Just a couple of common misconceptions when it comes to landlord insurance. Um, so this one is there's no cover between um, tenancies. So when you set up the policy, you will have cover ongoing. Um, so even if the tenant vacates and you're waiting for a new tenant to move in or they're doing um, inspections, etc., you can keep the policy in place uh, because that policy will cover carpets, curtains, blinds, storm, water damage, etc. But it will also cover your liability. So those um, prospective tenants going in and out, you want to make sure that they're covered just in case, you know, God forbid they trip over and break their leg. Um, so you can keep the policy in place. The next one is that the policy should commence when you secure a tenant. As soon as you're legally responsible for a property, you should, admit, you should be insuring it, regardless of what type of insurance it is, if it's a building insurance or if it's just a general contents insurance, there should be a policy in place, like you would with a car, um, you wanna insure the risk. So you can take out a landlord insurance policy as soon as uh, your property settles, if you like, um, or you can take out your general home and contents if you want, and then once you start letting out the property, you can take out the landlord insurance. Completely up to you, um, but very important that you take out a policy um, before you start having prospective tenants go in there. Uh, the next one, uh, pets must be named on a lease agreement uh, for a claim to respond. Every insurer is differently. Uh, ABM will definitely cover for pet damage, even if the pet's not on the lease agreement, which is really great, as we know. Over the last few years, we've got a lot of tenants sneaking in pets. Um, we cover up to $70,000 of pet damage as well, which is quite substantial, uh, but always good to know that it's covered. I have another quick claims example for you. Um, this one's for an abandoned property with an abandoned dog. So back in 2021, there was a rental property that was abandoned by the tenant. The tenant left a lot of their belongings, as they generally do, and they also left their pet dog at the property as well. Really disappointing, dog's okay though, um, if you were worried. Um, so we covered this uh, claim, there was a few different scenarios uh, where we covered for. So the first one here is for theft. Uh, the tenant actually stole blinds from the property, which is really crazy because they left um, everything else. Uh, so the blinds were $1,500 to replace. Um, the landlord also was able to claim for accidental damage um, as there was damage to the walls and outside pergola. So there was accidental damage. Uh, last but not least, but most importantly, there was pet damage at the property, uh, doors, carpets, and window seals. Uh, this is probably uh, one of the smaller pet damage claims I've seen re uh, recently, but it's uh, over $3,000. So pet damage is very important to have under a policy. You never know who's gonna sneak in a pet. Um, and definitely if pets are being kept during, um, kept in the house during the day while people go to work and things like that, it's kind of hard to know what, what's going to happen anyway. Okay, so um, these damages here, uh, generally speaking, if you would hear of glass impact or fire damage where the tenant's been involved, you would probably think it's tenant damage. And I would have thought that before I, came into the insurance industry. I still kind of think it's a little bit misleading sometimes the way the insurers do it, but glass breakage. So for example, if a tenant accidentally breaks a glass window or if they break a shower screen, it's actually called glass breakage. It's not called tenant damage, uh, it's called glass breakage. Any glass breakage needs to be claimed under a building insurance policy. And the thing that you need to look out for is if you are taking out a cheaper building insurance policy, the insurer might not cover glass breakage if the tenant's involved, okay? They might only cover glass breakage if it's a fire event or if it's a storm event. So it's important to look out for that one. Uh, the next one is impact damage. So if the tenant drove their car into a garage door, for example, um, sometimes the tenant's car insurance can help out um, and pay that one, but usually the landlord would just make a claim through us and that's called impact damage. So even though tenant was related, um, it's impact damage and it's under building insurance as well. Uh, and the last one is accidental fire. So tenant leaving uh, candles unattended or something like that. 
Um, fire is covered under our policies as fire and it's broad. So fire means bushfire, fire means accidental fire. It doesn't matter, it's just fire. Every insurer covers fire differently. Um, generally speaking, specialised policies should cover the same as we do. Um, but it's really important that you do ask if you've got fire, what type of fire? Because bushfire could be an addition and tenant damage as a fire could be an addition too. Um, so that's building insurance as well. So just something to be mindful of. Um, embargo is placed when um, there is a risk in an area. So generally speaking, uh, we don't have permanent embargoes uh, where we will not insure a suburb in South Australia. However, there are insurers that do have areas in South Australia that they will not insure due to it being a risk of a flood, a risk of a bushfire, a uh, risk of tsunami or what, whatever it could be. Um, we are underwritten by QBE, so we don't have this issue, but you may hear of talk where there may be um, higher risk suburbs. Uh, we don't have any here in South Australia. Um, your policy will be priced on, um, if it's platinum, it will be priced on the building and where it's located. Relocation and temporary accommodation. I do get this question quite a bit. Um, so if there is, for example, like water damage in a property and a tenant needs to vacate for a period of time, um, we're asking who puts the bill for their accommodation. Um, tenants would think landlord um, puts the bill for the accommodation and they might go and stay in a nice uh, hotel. Um, landlords are not responsible to pay for a tenant accommodation for a tenant. They're also not responsible to seek that accommodation either. Generally what happens is the tenant and the landlord will come to an agreement where the tenant won't pay their rent for a couple of weeks while the property is being repaired and they'll put the claim in for loss of rent. So landlord's happy, got the repair time covered, tenant maybe not so much, uh, but they do receive their rental payments as used to uh, seek term accommodation in that time. Sublimits are also something to be mindful of if you are comparing policies. Um, sublimits just mean that it's a maximum amount that they'll cover for a certain event, things to look out for, uh, pet damage, scorching, and electric motor burnout. Uh, basically, it just means you can say, we'll cover you for $100,000, but we're only going to cover $1,000 of pet damage. Just um, basically to keep in mind, if there are sublimits under a policy, uh, what they are and if they actually are going to be um, worth taking out that policy. We don't have any sublimits under Ultra or Platinum. Last but not least, uh, what's not covered under the policy? So general run of the mill expenses, like your bond expenses, so your cleaning, your unpaid water bills, your gardening, uh, won't be covered under the policy. So that's why it's important just to make sure that you have your bond. Um, wear and tear won't be covered. It won't be covered under any insurance policy. Um, living in a property over time, there will always be wear and tear. Mold, uh, mold's not covered under the policy. There are um, considerations to mould, you know, if it comes about because there was some big storm damage, you couldn't get into the property, things like that. Generally speaking, mould in a bathroom won't be covered by any insurance company. Damage caused by rodents, uh, damage that's a result of uh, lack of maintenance and damage that has occurred over a period of time, for example, a slow leak. So insured events um, that are covered need to just occur. They can't be something that happens for a long period of time. All right, so that is it for me. Um, if anyone has any questions. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, this, Say it loud. Uh, change, sorry? Say it loud. Yeah, this change in the legislation that we're Potentially, um, it could impact, but we wouldn't be able to see for at least you know a year. We wouldn't be able to forecast. And I mean, the way it is in different states as well, they've reduced the amount of um, bond that they can take anyway. So really, it, we can't predict it at this point. It's it just works out straight away. Yeah, yeah. Every, everywhere else is four weeks. The same thing. Yeah. Everywhere, every, every, every other state is four weeks. The other one, the other question is, um, since we are the Amphetamine Capital Global, uh, 
uh, and they're talking about uh, mandatory testing mm. potentially in the future. Now, if they mandate, it's like mandatory test properties, maybe 10% of the properties in South Australia are going to be positive for the manufacturing. Probably higher than Why? 10%. Right. Um, How's insurance going to actually deal with that? If it can even, is it even possible for insurance to deal with that? At the moment, it doesn't seem likely that the government would put that into the Tenancies Act just because it would be a massive cost to landlords um, or landlord insurance, which would then mean a massive cost to landlords overall anyway because you'd have to increase premiums to cover it. And tenants go in and out all the time. It's just really hard. Um, as it stands, if a tenant said, I want it property tested before I move in, it would be the cost of the tenant if um, the reading is below the prescribed level. Um, however, um, what testing I'm talking about? Testing for methamphetamine contamination. Yeah, so if if the tenant wanted uh, the walls tested, etc., and it actually comes over the prescribed level, so it is actually contaminated, it doesn't work the same with every insurer, but EDM will consider the claim um, and we can consider cleaning that as well. So if there are a lot, if there's you know reports from neighbours and things like that, and the tenant does want to get it tested, they are liable if it is under um, the prescribed level. But as it stands, we can consider it under drug lab cleanup, even if there's no drug lab found. It's interesting mm -hmm. that the government actually takes the position of understanding that there's a balance there because if they if they were to mandatory bring that in, that would be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll happen. No. It um, happen for a, lot, a number of reasons. Statistically, we're finding, we find now that the, uh, the methamphetamine is, is potentially reducing, largely because the, the, the uh, precursors aren't available so readily uh, to produce the methamphetamine. We've actually taken over now as the number one, we have more per head of capita use of cocaine than any other country in the world. Um, and that's becoming the big drug of choice of cocaine. So it's replacing it. It's, and, and it's probably better because it's natural. Just more expensive. It's, it's not damaging. It's, it's, it is, but so it's, it's so more readily available. Still have the that, that's what kind of the um, if yeah, you I, look at I guess, yeah, yeah. I, but I, I think we'll find it. The, 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 the government won't regulate it. Because no, but it, like, they did it in New Zealand. They did it in New Zealand and it's been an absolute bug fight over there. The regulator won't. The method of testing. Does cocaine damage the walls? No, <laughs> just just the walls of your nose. No, I was saying it's, 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 it's natural. The house itself. <laughs> <laughs> just get the rich people. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, if the house has to be replaced because of fire, etc. Yeah. Do you re do you give them? Do you replace it as it is, or you? pay out a certain amount for the landlord? Yeah, so generally speaking, it would be um, at the discretion of uh, the landlord and the claim specialist. So there are times when we will uh, just pay out um, the rebuild cost. Um, sometimes you might want to rebuild at a different location or something like that, then the funds would just be issued to you. Um, otherwise, we would rebuild at today's cost as long as your sum insured is adequate. Mm. Yeah, and it has okay. Yeah. Because I'm, my parents' insurance was saying to me, you know, who I'm going to replace it as it is if anything happens. They will or they will not replace the house, but you know, you don't forget. If you want to make any alterations, I'm not really sure where it works. Yeah, it if really you want depends. To make it big, yeah. yeah, some insurers will have um, the option as replacement value. Um, so you can just choose that they'll replace your property at whatever cost they believe it is to be. Um, or it's kind of like the same as when you insure your car as well. Um, or you can just choose the figure yourself. So um, we don't well, they actually replace that they've got builders themselves. So they will, you know, they're going to employ yep. their own builders to build the house as it is now. Yeah, so then you would um, negotiate the, the payout. Yeah, yeah. you can so negotiate. So you guys, you can negotiate to be paid out as okay. opposed to the rebuild. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Does anyone have any more questions? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of questions along the way, but I can't remember. <laughs> 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 we write them down. <laughs> yeah. When you said the tenant can check the 
case of that Scott drugs mm -hmm. and the test done, and that one is over a level, mm -hmm. you say consider to, what does considered mean? Yeah, so every claim has to be considered. Lots of factors go into whether or not we could pay a claim. So I can't say we will pay any pet damage claim because there may be a situation where we wouldn't pay it. Um, I, I can't say yes or no ever. Um, neither can a claim specialist until a claim has been lodged. So everything has to be um, considered. The claim I actually showed you before um, wasn't a drug lab, it was actually purely recreational use. So the people in that property weren't manufacturing the drug, they were just using the drug recreationally, um, which is pretty intense that it did that much damage, but that just goes to show, um, we went in there, we tested it, it's over the prescribed level. There was no lab, no one was in there cooking uh, methamphetamines. Um, but we were, we were covering them. And some insurers will say they only cover if a drug lab is found or if um, police have been in there and they've discovered a uh, drug lab. Um, but obviously over the years, um, we figured out during the claims process that the amount of damage that can be done from recreational use can sometimes even be more than a, a small drug lab. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. um, I guess, yes, I, I would always say consider, I can never say we'll definitely cover anything. <laughs> Did you have another one? Okay. No. <laughs> I've, I've, actually, I've, I've actually got two questions. I've got oh, one for you and one for both of you. Okay. Um, the question is, which state has the most claims? Oh, <laughs> today? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, you would be one. looking at um, which state has the most policies, probably. Um, it might not be that there's the most claims. It would be dependent on a few different factors. Right. Um, we have a number of our clients, our biggest clientele would be in New South Wales and Victoria and in WA. Um, as I said, there's, there's a head office over there. Um, mm. Definitely not in South Australia, it's still growing here. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be able to say, unfortunately. It's not okay. the stuff that I, that I have. Yeah. yeah. And the other question is, there's a whole bunch of new reforms that are coming into um, Queensland. So, and, and one, of the, one of the reforms is that the landlords are no longer, oh, sorry, tenants are no longer responsible for damage to property caused by domestic violence. Mm. So it goes onto the landlord. So now the landlords are responsible, just like employees are responsible. So if a, da if, if a property gets damaged, and I've seen domestic violence damage, it's, it's like every door is broken. Um, you know, ceilings are broken. Basically, the whole house is smashed up, mm. um, and they're saying that it's now it's the, the landlord's fault. Um, they they wear the bill, so you can't chase the tenant anymore because SACAT won't or or or, 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 or Q, Q -Cat. Q -Cat or whatever Q -Cat. it is. Mm. Um, I'm saying SACAT because it could come into South Australia. This kind of laws as well, mm. so you can't you can't chase the tenant anymore because SACAT will not do an order for something that the tenant is not liable for. Mm -hmm. But where does landlord's insurance sit with that? Mm. Yeah, so you, you would still put a claim in for the damages, yes. Okay, so we even, don't, if a, even if a don't tenant is not responsible for, for paying it, so who do you yeah. chase for? Tenants aren't actually responsible anymore for any accidental damage, um, so we wouldn't seek recovery from them anyway. Um, right. So we would consider it the same way. Right, okay. Yeah. I think it's worth bearing in mind though, that They've got to be domestic violence has to be a proven thing. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it does. It has to be proven by a police report for sure. Yeah. But, but it's quite odd, isn't it, that they'll cover accidental damage, but yet they won't cover domestic violence possibly, and yet that's malicious, really. Regardless, they're still smashing up your property. Yeah. Day. So mm -hmm. that's a real fine line between domestic and malicious, and and it's all to do with the wording and the interpretation, is it not? Yeah. So at the end that's of the right. day, they're smashing your property up. That's malicious damage, yeah. and, and that's yeah. what that would be seen that's as in the court. court. And I think yeah. I think that gets back to where landlords are concerned. Um, landlords need to start getting a voice out there and taking on the, the correct. Oh, yeah. I if agree. Nobody, nobody I agree. talking Who's to the me? likes of us or, or <laughs> the property no. manager. It's your local member. Yeah. He's the goose that passes this legislation. Yeah, but again, mm. it still does sit with insurances because it's all to do with the wording. So how do you define malicious damage as opposed to domestic? But violence? that's not that's not a legislative thing. The, the, the definition of for the where the insurer is concerned isn't legislative. That's an individual insurer's 
terminology. But that's what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's where but insurance that's something is such which I, a dodgy Something you'll never, line. you're not going to solve that problem. No. What we can solve is the issues like we're talking about domestic violence or the, the potential of the, 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 the testing for methamphetamine. As an industry, being property, being owners, the owners have to get together and get a voice out there. Because mm. we're so disjointed, we don't have a, sing, a singular voice. And we should be saying to the local member, yes. listen, you goose, mm. this is the situation. You bring this in and you're going to have 3% of landlords sell up. Now, in your wisdom, Mr. Politician, every state has downsized their subsidised housing. Yeah. Every state in Australia. Yeah. Consequently, what's happened is the politicians in their brains have said, OK, what should happen is the private sector should now be supplying yeah. the accommodation. Thank you. And that's not the role of the private sector mm -hmm. to supply subsidised accommodation. That's the role of government. And we as an industry have to be going to the local member and saying, listen, you goose, this is the situation. You've got to get this sorted out and stop pandering to the bleeding hearts out there thinking you'll get more votes by saying, boo hoo hoo, poor little tenant. Mm. Your role as a government is subsidised housing. Our role in the private sector is to supply residential tenancies. Mm. I don't, I don't yes. disagree with you, but yes. when, like you were saying, and, and true, as I, I well know, like that we are the meth capital, or we want to become the co whatever we're becoming, yeah. and we've got the assurances that it is you know, not really insurable for these sorts of behaviours. So we're insuring the property, but what are the chances are that that insurance is going to cover those domestic crackhead no, no, violence? Like you said, they all go hand in hand. No, domestic violence would be covered. Actually, uh, it should be covered. Uh, should yeah, be covered. it would be covered. They're taking the insurance policy, the insurance mm -hmm. companies. Because we know for a fact that there are some insurance companies... But they've just said if it's classed as domestic violence, it's not. Yeah. So I'm, I'm no, sorry, we're, I'm we're, no, sorry, we're, 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 we will consider yeah, domestic yes, violence. Consider, but that's yes. what I'm saying, consider that's open to interpretation. Yeah. No, but there's yeah, no, yeah. oh yes we will, we'll consider it. I can't it. say yes yeah. to anything. That's, because as, yeah, I, I, said, as yeah. I said, you lodge a claim, it will be considered. I can't say we're uh, definitely yeah. going to cover the domestic no, what, violence. What, 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 what I was saying, yeah. Can we ask the policy will cover domestic violence. Did I just violence. clarify for this lady? Yeah. So what, what, what I was saying has got nothing to do with insurance. So the, the government has stepped in and they have taken the rights away from landlords in chasing the appropriate person for that for their property. So what, what they've done is so you put a tenant into their house in, into your house, they smash it up through a domestic violence situation and then they go, we're not responsible. We don't pay anything, we're not responsible. So it falls back onto insurance, right? Mm. But the thing is that there is there is a piece of legislation that has taken it away from the people who have done it, which means that... I understand that and I totally agree with okay. that. The insurance is still a fine line whether that gets paid out as such, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, or does no, that I, just I, sit I, I'd, I'd automatically like to... under willful damage? I'll go back and I'll, and I'll just research that. My understanding of the legislation is it, it isn't, cut and cut, it isn't as cut and dried as that. What it's saying is that if the, e.g., and we know that 90% of domestic violence is against women. So what they're saying is that if the woman is in a domestic violence situation, she is able to get out of that domestic violence situation into a protected and safe area without having a consequence of doing that. He's not free and clear. Yes, he is. I, I, I'll check that. No, no, I'll, yeah, no yes, I will yes, check yes, that he is because, because, because the, yeah. they, they're talking about getting her out of the environment yeah. and giving yeah. uh, giving her the ability to get oh, out of that tenancy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. getting out of the lease and uh, being responsible for damage is is two different things. I, I, so, I, I'll, I will check but, that um, um, and come yeah. back to you because my... I, I, so my, my, my understanding is that you can't put... You're like, you, you can't actually say who, who started the domestic violence, whether it was he or she, right? So it's both. So that's neither of them yeah. are actually responsible. Well, mm. well that, that's, they have no rental properties, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it's, it's going to go. It's too stressful. That, that's, <laughs> actually, that's actually where, where it's going to go. That's, they, the they will. That's, a, that's the point you should be making yeah. to the local member. That, that's where it will, if that's that where that happens, it will go. Yeah. Where are you going to house these people? In motels? Just out of curiosity, we were talking about the, the shamals of the South Korean country, the yeah. um, are they looking to, because of the damage it's actually causing the industry, reverse? No, no. 
Really? Yeah, <laughs> politicians <laughs> panned with the bleeding hearts. <laughs> and that's with the horse dancing. And the bleeding hearts have got that, we've got the year of the politicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, in New Zealand, you had a set of guidelines were put down for testing meth. When the new government came in, when Jacinta Ardern's government came in, they had they appointed a new uh, chief um, chemist or whatever his title was over there, and he went, oh no 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 no, that test is too high. It should only be this amount. So they changed their mind with the amount of the testing, as as the, the, the degree of contamination. The same as you find some places will go, yes, um, it's only a room where the where the contamination is, and often you find the most common room is the bathroom or the toilet because they sit in the, in the, in the loo, smoking their pipe, and it's going out the window. Mm. I think you can answer this to address your question as well. When we have a uh, in-house insurance specialist, right? And I can assure you that there are companies that pay out far, I think you far more than our other companies as well. So they may not be absolute or absolutely pay, but there are some companies that you know, pay far more than the other And then, for a housing to stay at the current rental. Yes. And e EVM, and I, I can tell you, EVM is certainly one of the better ones in the marketplace. Yeah, we sure. find statistically with what we do, the average claim, and we have claims that come through to us as a general claim, what we call under our subscription. Then we have claims coming through to us, which is the balance of what the insurers paid out as compared to the claim. So the claim, and we're seeing now the quantum of claims rising in the Two years ago, three years ago, the average claim was about three grand coming through to us. It's now up to eight. Mm. But what we're finding is that uh, talking in insurance across the board, the average claim we see is 64% of the claim. That's not, even, not just that EBM saying claims that come to us and we deal with a whole range of people who deal with a whole range of insurers. You know, your state government insurers and your, your motor vehicle, uh, the double AMIs, all those sort of people. The average claim is 64%. So we pick up the balance. But yeah, EBM is one of the better, certainly one of the better ones. But I still get back to my initial comment that as an industry, we've got to start taking on the politicians. Mm -hmm. Because they're causing a lot of problems. Sorry? Who's going to initiate that? Look, I think, I think that, to my personal opinion, that should be the REIs in each state. Because they've got, they've got the tentacle to get out to their property managers and get this going and get these sort of, these sort of things happening. And that's where it should, I believe it should be driven from. You pay whatever your, 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 yeah. your management fee is. The REIs should be doing something in the background to, yeah. to work with the industry. They've got a central hub that they can work with. Just my view. Mm. I like this guy. <laughs> it's an activist. Yep. Sorry? That's all right. You're an activist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I just get... I, I've been in this game too long. And I've seen too many changes. Lot, yeah. And I, I'm over these... And I'm over the change that's come that come through... The changes that come through which are, which are being put onto us by politicians who yeah. walk around and they have, I mean, you get a change of government and it's the same story, different face. Mm -hmm. And they all, the spin doctors all write all the stuff. And you saw it, what came through in the, the budget in, in Victoria. I mean, give me a break. And there's what they're doing in Queensland. And, and they're all the same. On the one hand, they're saying, you know, look after your retirement. People are trying to buy properties, you know, for their retirement because they don't even know where to invest their money these days, mm. if they've got money anyway. And on the other hand, you know, even if you've got properties, you still can't afford to live like a human being. No, you, you can't. can't. You but, can't. But the state governments don't care about your retirement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Doesn't interest them. That's yeah. a, that's, on that's the a, one hand, the that's same, the federal you, know, government. you know, all the responsibility falls on the individual, you know. You've got too much, you know, you've got too much, you can't get the age pension. You've got uh, not enough, you can't live on the age pension. You know, you're trying to do the right thing and you get penalised. If we want to do something as industry, we've got to get together 
and start getting, and it's no good lobbying the federal politicians because they aren't the ones that do it. We gotta lo lobby the state politicians because they're the ones that make the legislation for each state in residential tenancies. Okay. Not the federal guys, it's all state. Yes. The federal guys aren't the ones. It's all state government driven. Yeah. And that's where the REI should come into the, into the fore. Yeah. That is my sermon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get politics right out of real estate. They, don't, yeah, they it, actually yeah. don't belong there. Yeah. They don't belong there. We can't have rights without property rights. Mm. So. Even before that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, are there any more questions, debates, comments? No. <laughs> have you got, Have you seen any, uh, any right. situations where claims?